A production fee for your hometown health connection was made by Buffalo Healthy Living Magazine and its sponsors. Welcome. Our topic is diabetes. How prevalent is it? According to the CDC, 28.7 million people, almost 9% of the U.S. population, has been diagnosed with diabetes. 1.6 million adults, 20 and older, that's almost 6% of all U.S. adults, have been diagnosed with diabetes. And they report having type 1 and that they use insulin. Over 3 million adults with the diagnosed diabetes started using insulin within a year of their diagnosis. So on this edition of your Hometown Health Connection, we're going to talk with two medical experts, one who has type 1 diabetes, about the differences between type 1 and type 2 diabetes, treatment, and management, here on your Hometown Health Connection. I'm John DeShulo, welcome to the program. The Diabetes Endocrinology Center of Western New York specializes in diagnosing, managing, and treating type 1 and type 2 diabetes and its complications. The center also treats other disorders such as thyroid disease and metabolic disorders. The team at the Diabetes Endocrinology Center have really devoted their lives for caring for people with diabetes and endocrinology diseases or dysfunctions. The center is also home to one of the largest insulin pump programs in the region, with both type 1 and type 2 diabetics on pumps. Potential pump patients are carefully screened and trained in basic nutrition and accurate carbohydrate counting before starting on the pump. Pump training takes place at the center by nurse educators who are certified pump trainers. Nutrition coaches are also an integral part of the team, providing healthy foods and meal plans. Let's welcome our expert medical guest, Dr. Ajay Chaudhry. He is a professor of medicine, chief of the Division of Endocrinology and Metabolism, program director of the Endocrine Fellowship at the Jacobs School of Medicine at the University of Buffalo, medical director of the Diabetes Center at Collider Health, and president of the Leadership Board of Buffalo ADA. And also Dr. Robert Borowski is a clinical assistant professor of medicine, adult and pediatric endocrinology, Endocrine Diabetes and Metabolism Fellowship at the Jacobs School of Medicine, the University of Buffalo. Boy, doctors, you have such cred incredible credentials. Thank you for joining us here on your Hometown Health Connection. Thank you, John. You're Absolutely. welcome. Thank Dr. Chaudhry, I'm going to start with you. Let's start with the very basic difference between what is type 1 diabetes and type 2 diabetes. Okay. Yeah, so um, as you know that insulin is the hormone that is basically important for um, you know, getting glucose into the muscles uh, and the fat cells, etc. So in people with type 1 diabetes, they are not producing any insulin at all. And so the only treatment that is available is to give them insulin. While in people with type 2 diabetes, they are capable of making insulin, but for some reason, the body is not using that insulin properly. So we have ways and means of then you know, either augmenting the amount of insulin that they can make or making the body utilize whatever insulin that they are making more efficiently. And therefore, a lot of the times, people with type 2 diabetes are being treated with other medications before they need to go on to insulin. This is so much to talk about, and we want to get to all of it in this half hour. Uh, Dr. Borowski, I want to make mention that in managing type 1 diabetes, it, it can be complex and difficult, uh, especially because of our busy lives. And it's something that you have a very personal connection to because we learned just before the program, at age three, you were diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. So it's incredible that you're helping people manage through it and living through it on your own as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I think there's a lot of barriers, you know, in managing diabetes or really any chronic disease. And that's part of the difficulty um, is that what we need to do to successfully manage diabetes uh, is really an astronomical amount that we uh, that we ask our patients and that that I've I've had to do myself. Um, so learning to to make things easier, to have a positive attitude, uh, is, is very important. Um, and finding a support system that can kind of uh, uh, foster that environment where we learn and can be successful uh, is hugely important. Um, you, you said something earlier, Dr. Chad. We were meeting in the conference room that with type one focusing on just a plan, 
and, and having a discipline. It, it was interesting what you said. Yeah, so, you know, what I've seen uh, managing people with type 1 diabetes for such a, you know, long, uh, if, you know, for such a long time is that it does require some management skills, organizational skills. And what I've seen is that people who make it important to control their diabetes with the management skills and the organizational skills that they learn when they are managing diabetes, it really sets them up you know, for success. Because all of us understand the importance of time management yeah. Yeah, in anything that we do in our lives. And uh, I think that really what I've seen is that the fact that they're able to manage their time uh, in trying to control their diabetes really sets them up for success. And in controlling that, Dr. Browski, when you were three, your parents had to help you control that. And you obviously learned along the way, and now you're helping others. Talk to me about what that journey was like for you as a child growing up, with the things that maybe you couldn't do or eat that the other children were, were enjoying. So there were a lot of ups and downs, and there still, there still are. That, that never goes away. I think I've just uh, found ways to better manage it or cope with it. Um, a lot of those skills uh, that I learned along the way were from my parents, from other healthcare providers, and frankly, a lot of other people with type 1 diabetes. Yeah. And those skills, you know, have led to my success not only in my diabetes and my life. And I think that's really what's important is to try to find a way to make this diagnosis, this chronic disease, something that you're proud of, something that leads to, to you know, something bigger, much more than just your health. Um, and that's really important um, t uh, to find that level of uh, acceptance um, and to be successful. You mentioned mental health, Dr. Browski. How important is that, Dr. Chaudhry, the, the mental health aspect? You know, when someone is given a diagnosis, whether it's diabetes or anything, it, a light switch goes off, I have to deal with this, how do I deal with it, there's a million questions. How important is the mental health of somebody and the support that they get to, to go through it? Exactly, yeah. I think you bring up a very, very important point out here, John. So I kind of look at it from two, two aspects. Um, one is that just because somebody has had this diagnosis of diabetes, obviously it, it is a stressful time and uh, you know, it kind of affects how you kind of perceive things. Um, the important thing I tell people when they first get diagnosed with diabetes is that you know, it's nothing that, you know, it's something that has happened uh, it is important to understand that having diabetes does not mean that you are going to get complications of diabetes because diabetes causes high blood sugars and it's the high blood sugars that causes complications. <clears throat> so it's important that if you control your blood sugars, you are not going to get those complications. And the other thing that I impress upon is that it's very important to make sure that you control this disease mm -hmm. rather than letting the disease control you. And I've seen something that we call the sunrise phenomena sometimes. When people come to us, their diabetes is not under control and they are looking, you know, they are not looking eye to eye. But as we help them and get their diabetes under control, slowly and gradually, you know, they are, you can see that they are becoming much more confident, much more positive, because now they are under control of their diabetes right. and not letting the diabetes control them. Seems like there is a lot to it, Dr. Browski, in, in managing the insulin and taking measurements and, and your blood sugars. And it, 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 it's a lot to manage, but it can be done, right? Absolutely, yeah. And, and now you, you have little children, right? Your I do, children. yep. Do you find yourself monitoring what they eat? You must be very sensitive to that, knowing your, your, your history. And Yes, I do. So, I mean, I, I'm conscious of it. And I, you know, it, it, it's something that we incorporate healthy living yeah. that is into our everyday lifestyle. But at the same time, you have to, to also live your life. Um, you don't want to let it uh, control you. Um, it's a part of your life and you have to uh, come to grips with that and, and find uh, successful ways to, to, um, to deal with that. But you can't let it hang over you. I think there's so much uh, pressure and feelings of guilt um, and, and a lot of denial that uh, type 1, uh, uh, people with type 1 diabetes or really any chronic disease deal with. Um, so that we, those are some of the things you have to learn to, to uh, get over um, or deal with and, and uh, find coping mechanisms, uh, you know, and it makes, it makes it a lot easier. Let's talk about technology, Dr. Chaudhry. So much 
technology has changed over the last three years, few years, and certainly since you know you've been practicing medicine. Talk to me about some of the advancements. Oh my God! I mean, say you know, I've uh, I've practiced diabetes at a time where people used to have you know uh, glass insulin syringes wow. and had to boil the needles, and now. You know, we have pens that are pre-filled with insulin. You know, we have needles that are extremely small. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, especially in the last five to six years, there's been just kind of so much that has happened that we have these insulin pumps, you know, that people can have so that every time they eat, you know, it's giving a small amount of insulin all the time to right. control your blood sugars when you're fasting. And every time you eat, maybe you eat six times a day, you know, you can take that bolus of insulin you know, through your pumps. And then really the very exciting part has been that now with these continuous glucose monitors, you know, it has taken away the need for people to have to check their blood sugars, um, you know, prick their fingers to check blood sugars. And we are able to give this these uh, sensors, you know, where it kind of sits on top of your skin I for 14 you days. I understand, wear the, you wear the device. You wear the device, you know, it sits on top of your skin and it is me measuring blood sugars all the time, all through the 24 hours. You see hours. it on your cell phone. You can see I, it on I've your cell this, phone. I've seen this firsthand. Exactly, you can see it on the cell phone. You know, it can predict whether your sugars are gonna go up or they are going to go low even before that happens. Yeah. So you can take, uh, you know, some protective, you know, you can take certain, certain things to avoid the low blood sugars. And now these pumps and sensors are interacting with each other so that you know, just like the body would do that as your sugars are going down, insulin secretion would go down or insulin, so these pumps can reduce the amount of insulin that you're getting. And if sugars are going up, you know, it automatically increases the amount of insulin that you're getting. So it's fascinating, you know, to see. And with all this technology, you know, I'm seeing more and more people, you know, getting into control without increasing the risk of you know, hypoglycemia, right. which is And which thanks is to the thing. technology, that's it, it, somewhat easier to control as Absolutely. opposed to the, the pinprick, which it, I can't even imagine. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That yeah, there were times when we had to tell people to check their blood sugars because we had no other option. Yeah. And now it's really fascinating for me to see that when I tell people with diabetes, you know, you don't have to check your, you don't have to prick your finger. It's, it's an amazing thing to see, you know, how they kind of really kind of feel okay. <clears> That's <throat> one of the burden that, you know, we are going to be getting away from. We just have a few more minutes left in this segment. One of the questions we wanted to ask Dr. Browski is traveling and making arrangements. You know, so as we move on, we talk about controlling a situation, but in a home environment or a work environment that you're used to, you have a routine. What do you do in a traveling world where you're out and, out and about? Preparation, it's key. You have to think of every scenario, how it's gonna play out and being prepared for it. Um, so whether it be having enough supplies, making sh you sure you have a backup plan, um, and even to how you're going to fly or um, you know, what are some of the steps that you have to take. Not everybody who um, is wearing a CGM should go through the normal TSA check, uh, checkpoints. Um, so, so if you're wearing the glucose <clears throat> monitor, going through the checkpoint might not work. You're, you shouldn't. You shouldn't. You Why need, is that? Uh, because it, the, the technology, the x-rays, the beams that they mm -hmm. use can actually interfere with the CGM and throw it off. And then you're left in a circumstance where you're traveling, more stress, um, you know, your schedule is much different, eating is much different, and now you have a, a glucose monitor um, that isn't working properly, and it can create even more disruption, um, which is the last thing I think any of us want well, to have It seems like there's <laughs> enough to, to manage without that. Yeah. We're going to continue our conversation and uh, maybe pick up a little bit more on type 2 diabetes in the next segment, along with some other questions for Dr. Chaudhry and Dr. Browski right here. And uh, stay with us because we're going to share some important information now about where you can contact these medical experts. And the website that is, has all the links you need is ubmdim.com. A lot of information, but that website's the one you want. Welcome back to your hometown Health Connection. I'm John DeShulo, and uh, our topic is diabetes. Note that this past July 2021, it was a celebration of the 100th anniversary of the discovery of insulin which transformed diabetes from basically a death sentence to what is basically a chronic condition. There is currently a bill before Congress to limit the cost of insulin to about $35 a month that would benefit the nearly 30 million Americans who are dealing with diabetes. Insulin, a life-saving drug that is taken daily by anybody who has diabetes, and it's grown increasingly expensive in recent years, 
And many diabetes patients ration their medicines or discontinue them because of the cost. Now get this statistic, about one in five Americans who take insulin would save money under this proposal, according to a recent analysis from the Kaiser Family Foundation. Wanted to share that statistic as we welcome back Drs. Uh, Ajay Chaudhry and Robert Borowski uh, from the Diabetes Endocrinology Center of Western New York. Dr. Chaudhry, it seems like we've, we're managing complications and some of those complications include cost. And we talked earlier about sometimes the, the, the uh, insurance is, is, a, is complicated alone. So now we're talking about managing all of this and the patient is left with, I, I can't pay for it. Mm -hmm. How does that fly? Yeah, and you know, that is one of the realities of uh, healthcare, you know, in, uh, in the US and it still kind of astonishes me that a country that is so rich, uh, sometimes, you know, we are not being able to take care of the chronic, you know, population with mm -hmm. chronic diseases. Um, so, you know, there are some ways and means that we try and help, you know, people with diabetes. Um, you know, there are some programs, patient assistance programs, you know, that people can avail of. Uh, we do try and find ways and means of how we can, you know, support, uh, you know, with different kind of ways um, uh, you know, as far as people with diabetes is concerned. But the most important thing I tell people with diabetes is that, you know, really kind of go towards an insurance that is going to be able to provide you, you know, with the medications that yeah. you need. So factor that in when you are calculating your premiums, et cetera. And certainly if that bill is passed, that would help greatly to... Yeah, that. so, you know, I'm the uh, president of the Community Leadership Board of the American Diabetes Association. You know, we have done a lot of advocacy you know, to try and limit the cost of insulin, um, you know, and I, and, I, and, and, and I feel strongly that this is going to happen. Let's hope so. Yeah. We'll help support you. Are there screening tests, Dr. Chaudhry, that somebody should do annually just to check to see if they have diabetes or if they feel they're headed in that direction? Yeah. So the screening test, if somebody has diabetes, uh, the, you know, the, the three complications of diabetes that we want to be aware of is that if blood sugars are not controlled, you know, they can affect the eyes, they can affect the nerves, and they can affect the kidneys. So we basically ask everybody, even if you are not having any symptoms of, you know, eye problems, to have a regular eye checkup where somebody puts drops in your eyes, dilates and has a look at the back of your eyes to make sure there is nothing developing at the back. Clearly every time you know, that you're seeing the doctor or the provider who's looking after your diabetes, you know, it's important to mention anything that is going on with your feet. Once every six months there is an exam that is done to make sure that the sensation is okay and that the circulation is okay. And then once every year, we do a random, you know, a urine sample to check for any protein in the urine. Yeah. So these are the three things that we definitely want everybody with diabetes to have yearly. Right. And if you're feeling uh, tingling in your feet or you're having some eye issues, that it could be a potential sign. It could be yeah. a potential, yeah. But let's talk, Dr. Browski, about the insulin pump program. You know, we've talked so much about how important insulin is. What is the pump program? So. Uh, in all of our practice locations, uh, especially for type 1 diabetes, you know, we, we want to see people um, use technology, use uh, insulin delivery systems that are going to benefit from them, uh, for them. Um, that looks a little bit different for everybody. Um, pumps are a huge asset, especially now that they combine with the uh, continuous glucose monitor uh, technology and can make some of uh, these manipulations to the insulin automate it. So does the pump inject the insulin without you doing it? The pump does it automatically? So it, it does a baseline uh, insulin delivery. That's called the basal insulin. That's your 24 hour, you know, what your requirement is. And then for type ones, every time you eat or your blood sugar is high, you need to give a bolus. Um, now, a lot of the pump systems um, will automate the, the basal uh, in accordance to what you need. So if you're more active it actually, and you start to drop low, it will back off on the insulin. If your blood sugar starts to go up, again, it will start to increase some of the insulin. Um, a lot of the uh, pumps, the current systems, will actually give you an automated corrective bolus to help bring you down. Um, we still have to give uh, mealtime injections of insulin, counting carbs and putting that in. Um, but these systems, you know, decrease that burden 
uh, of the, the, the chronic disease tremendously. Is it different for someone with type 2 versus type 1 diabetes? There, there are differences and there are similarities. Um, you know, I think that pumps and, and CGMs uh, work really well for people with uh, type 1 diabetes, but the more we're using it in type 2 diabetes, we've seen that have success as well. Let's talk, Dr. Chaudhary, about the team at, at the uh, West New York Endocrinology and UB MD Endocrinology. Talk about that team, how they help the patients achieve their goals. Yeah. So the, you know, the most important person in the team, I can say, is the patient, him, himself or herself, right? And the team in the uh, UBMD endocrinology practices, obviously we are all endocrinologists. We are all board certified endocrinologists. We have gone through rigorous training uh, to, you know, to develop that expertise. We also have nutritionists. So basically when you come into the clinic, obviously nutrition is a big part to understand about nutrition. And then we have certified diabetes educators. So these are the pillars, you know, these are the four pillars. You know, the patient is the most important pillar, and then you have the providers, and then you have nutritionists, and you have certified diabetes educators. The other important thing is that, you know, the staff that you're going to interact with, you know, they all understand about what people with diabetes need and what people with diabetes go through. Some of the challenges that you mentioned, some of the stresses that you mentioned, so really, it's a dedicated team that has, that is, they have just got one motto. That is, that we are going to get the diabetes under control, you know, and clearly, the patient is the most important one that participates in it. And everybody's different. Yep. So somebody who might be a little more overweight or somebody type 2 versus type 1. So you really do have to get to know the patient. So your team has to be very vetted in who these people are and, and, and their lifestyle. And, and I would imagine diet, probably for, just observing, but if somebody was a type two diabetic, I would bet the diet is the first thing that you need to deal with. Yeah, so both for type one and type two, clearly diet becomes extremely important. One of the things I emphasize is that people with diabetes, the diet that they are following is really a healthy diet that most of the people, who even those who don't have diabetes, yeah. are following right now. Um, um, you know, for people with diabetes, clearly that carbohydrate counting becomes very, yeah. very important because they don't have any buffer. They have to take a certain amount of insulin to take care of those carbohydrates. In people with type 2 diabetes, you know, they are still making some of their own insulin. So if they are on insulin, then if they take a little bit more, the body can reduce their insulin and kind of keep the, keep the sugars under control. Dr. Yeah. Dr. Browski, we do like some foods that are not very good for us here in Buffalo. How do you find information if somebody has a question? I mean, certainly to, to call you or call their medical doctor, but th what resources can somebody go to? Yeah, outside of the, your team, um, you know, I think there's a lot of good online resources now, whether it be through JDRF or ADA, those are both uh, tremendous, uh, you know, reliable sources of in information. Um, but I also think that there are a lot of online support groups. Um, and even forums. And I think now with social media, um, more and more people with similar experiences are connecting. And I think that is vitally important. That's interesting, the connections, and I'm sure you see it too, Dr. Chaudhary, the, the, your patients talk to each other about maybe it's a diet or an exercise or, you know, or they just need some ins inspiring words to get through. Yeah, we've seen it change people's lives. You know, getting involved in advocacy, meeting another uh, person with uh, diabetes, um, and they can relate. And some of those things that we talked about earlier, the denial, the guilt, the pressure, you know, once they see that that is across the board, everybody deals with that, it becomes a little bit easier um, to, to manage. And you share coping mechanisms, things like that. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, I've seen it myself, I do it to this day. Yeah, and you still, know. you're still there doing it. Let's talk about, Dr. Chaudhary, the type one clinical trial and the type two clinical trial that people can participate in. and, and what is a clinical trial? What, what is that? Is somebody set up to get a placebo versus a drug that will help them? Mm -hmm. Explain that and, and how your organization helps. Yeah. So a clinical trial is the way that medicine advances. So some of the advances that I'm talking about right now that people with type 1 and type 2 diabetes can avail of is because there are people, you know, before them, you know, in the last 10 years who participated in some of these clinical trials. So these medications and these devices, you know, could be approved. 
You know, it goes through a rigorous process, you know, in terms of uh, being vetted by what we call the Institutional Review Board, Ethics Committee, etc. And right now, one of the studies that we are doing in people with type 1 diabetes under the, you know, the principal investigator is Dr. Dandona, who's been our mentor. You know, all of us have trained under him where we are trying some medications that could only be used in people with type 2 diabetes in people with type 1 diabetes. So you're using type 2 in type 1? Yes. Okay. So there are medications that are already approved for people with type 2 diabetes, but we are using it in people with type 1 diabetes to see whether we can reduce their need you know, for insulin, whether we can reduce the variability in their blood sugars, whether we can help them lose some weight if they are overweight. And this is a trial that is supported by the Juvenile Diabetes Research Federation. And there are only two centers in the world who are doing it. One is our center in Buffalo. Mm. And as I mentioned, Dr. Dendona is the principal investigator there. And then there is another center in the United Kingdom. Yeah, That's incredible. Yeah. So that here in Buffalo and the United Kingdom. Yes. So, you know, people with type 1 diabetes, because they are living in Buffalo or in the surrounding areas, can now try and avail of this opportunity of being able to participate in this clinical trial, you know, where we are trying to see whether we can use these type 2 diabetes drugs and, you know, reduce their need for insulin and also improve the variability. Can you share the, the names sugar. of some of these drugs? Yeah, so there is one drug that goes by the name of, you know, the semaglutide or Ozempic, and then there is another medication that is called Farxiga that we are using. And we've heard of these. We've yes, seen them Yes, because they are being used in people with type 2 diabetes, yeah. because the sense was that in people with type 1 diabetes, if they are not making enough insulin, can we use these medications? But, you know, we have found that there are some other mechanisms by which these medications could be working in people with type 1. And then in people with type 2 diabetes, one of the trials that we are doing is something called, you know, people with type 2 diabetes, they accumulate fat in the liver. And so that can cause some inflammation in the liver and ultimately lead to cirrhosis. And right now we are doing some clinical trials with certain medications, uh, you know, to see whether we can reduce, you know, the fat deposition in the liver and control that. And eventually in the next two or three months, we should also be getting some, some trials in people with type 2 diabetes, which is with once weekly insulin in people who are on multiple doses of insulin in type 2, and also with another medication in people with type 2 that has been shown to reduce blood sugars and also help with you know some weight loss in these wow, people. Wow, very complex, but it's yeah. happening right here and in, in the UK. So who yeah. knew that? Thank you, doctors, Dr. Ajay Chaudhry, Dr. Robert Borowski. We hope to see you back again. There's so much to talk to and uh, good luck to you and your work. Some incredible information we heard here in this half hour. Now, if you would like to connect with the Diabetes Endocrinology Center of Western New York, Here's that pen and paper that you're going to need because I'm going to show some addresses, but most importantly, a website. Locations again at Maple West Plaza, 705 Maple Road in Williamsville. Phone number there is 716-580-7300. UBMD Internal Medicine, 1020 Young's Road, Suite 110. That's in Williamsville. The number there, 961-9900. UBMD Internal Medicine, that's in the Coventus Building. They're downtown Buffalo, new building there, 1001 Main on the fourth floor in the city, 961-9900. And then UBMD Internal Medicine at 462 Grider Street in the city, room 1152. And the number there, 898-4803. Now, the website that has the link you need to all of this, very important, connect online at ubmdim.com. I'm John DeShulo. Thank you for watching. Stay safe and be well. A production fee for the preceding presentation of Your Hometown Health Connection was made by Buffalo Healthy Living Magazine and its sponsors.